So welcome, this is uh, continuing classes of this uh, topic of mastering the mind where we're working with uh, the two chapters from Shanti Deva, chapters four and five. And so I'll get into the content of that shortly. Let's go ahead and do a few prayers together before we begin. And I've got those queued up on uh, the screen here. So we're gonna recite this praise to Shakyamuni Buddha three times in English, again, recalling the qualities of the Buddha, also recalling how each and every one of us and all sentient beings have the potential to attain these same realizations, to achieve these great accomplishments that we're uh, uh, paying homage to the Buddha with. So again, we'll just recite this together. The founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct. Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you the completely and fully awakened one the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan. I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, knowledge and good conduct, Suga, knower of the world, supreme guide of to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan. I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. So then we'll do a short mandala offering. Again, we'll just do this in English, and then uh, after we recite the verse, we'll do the uh, offering mantra that is down below on the screen. I'll uh, be sure to scroll to that. Uh, again, as when we do this prayer, we try to visualize the entire phenomenal universe completely purified, made into a beautiful paradise, a Buddha realm that we're kind of offering to the merit field to receive blessings, to be able to receive these teachings and real, you know, realize them in our own minds. And so we'll again recite this in English. This ground anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Niryata Yami. Then we'll do the refuge verse before we, uh, uh, this be the last prayer that we do before the, uh, we'll do this once in English, twice in the Tibetan, and again, recalling that this verse is about reaffirm sense of safe direction in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, these three jewels that we find as our true refuge in this world. And then the last two lines, how we generate that thought of bodhicitta already, <clears throat> trying to and put our minds in that space of wanting to achieve the enlightenment, uh, our own enlightenment, so we can lead all others to that same state. And think that it's for this reason that we're going to engage in these teachings. So let's recite this once in English, again, twice in the Tibetan. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, May become a Buddha in order to benefit all standings. Sangye Todang Soki Choknam La Jangchu Bardu Dakni Kyabsuchi Daki Chunyan Gipe Sonam Gi Drola Penchir Sangye Drupar Sho Sangye Chodang Soki Choknam La Jangchu Bardu Dakni Kyabsuchi Daki Chunyan Gipe Sonam Gi Drola Penchir Sangye 
Drupasho. Okay, so again, thank you for joining tonight. Let's go ahead and start with a short meditation. It's always nice to have an opportunity to focus our mind a little bit, maybe to let go of some of the day's distractions, some of the preoccupations that we might have in our minds right now. And then on the basis of a bit more focused, calmer mind, we'll do a short meditation to set our motivation of bodhicitta. So find a good meditation posture and making sure that the back is somewhat straight, upright, and relaxing into this posture as best as you can. And then begin to attend to the breath. And again, I'm sure most of you have some technique that you already use with the breath. You're welcome to do that for the next few minutes. If you need a suggestion, then again, I generally encourage people to work with the point, uh, that area around the nostrils where you feel the air coming in and out when you breathe in and out through the nose. And making that your meditation object, just stay present with that. And in any of our meditations, when we see that the mind has wandered, that we've gotten distracted, caught up in other things, thoughts, what have you, at that time, then we bring the mind back, letting go of whatever it was that distracted us. We do this without any judgment, just very gently. So I'll ring the chime and we'll do this in silence for just a few minutes, and then I'll lead you in a short reflection. So now let's set our motivation together for this class this evening. And this whole text is really about how we enact this sincere motivation of bodhicitta, this aspiration to become a Buddha for the sake of all beings. 
you know, when we look at the world that we're living in and everything that is going on right now, and certainly, you know, all of throughout the entire human history and the history of this world, we can see that there's always that uncertainty, the tendency for there to be some level of dissatisfaction, discontentment, even greater forms of suffering at times. You can even see that when we do have some measure of happiness in our lives, that it's very fleeting and transitory. You know, the evidence is all around us all the time, not just right now in terms of what we're going through. The evidence is there that this is an unsatisfactory state that while we might have many good things in samsara, the things that we can enjoy with others, uh, those moments of pleasure, we really don't find anything that lasts. The only happiness that we can seek that will uh, be lasting and true is the happiness of the Dharma, and especially the happiness that will arrive, arise when we have worked on our minds to the greatest degree. So in engaging in these teachings, we want to bring that level of motivation, the recognition that what we are involved in is unsatisfactory for ourselves, but it's also unsatisfactory for all beings. This unenlightened existence is going to be problematic. And we've been involved in it from beginningless time. So it's time now with this rebirth that we currently have, with this human life that's rich with so much opportunity to use it to develop not just the mind of renunciation that turns away from our own suffering, our own dissatisfaction, but also the mind of bodhicitta, where we recognize that we're not alone in our predicament. All beings are just like us, simply wanting to be happy, wanting to not suffer, but continuing to be plagued by suffering and not finding any real happiness because they simply don't know the causes now that we've met with the Dharma and we've come to understand the causes of true happiness and peace, it's kind of our mission, our responsibility to dedicate ourselves to developing ourselves fully so we can then lead others on that path by practicing the way of the Bodhisattva. We can eventually help others to enter that path and achieve the same result that we are aspiring to achieve, the state of Buddhahood. So generate that motivation very deeply so that everything that we do here tonight becomes the cause for that result, your own enlightenment and the enlightenment of all beings. Okay. So uh, in this class, uh, this is, I think, around the fifth class, maybe fifth class, I can't remember, lost track of the number, but we have been working with um, the two chapters of four and five. Chapter four was on conscientiousness, again, conscientiousness being that mental factor that we have that's very virtuous. It kind of keeps us on our pathway because we understand the ramifications of going astray and we uh, know the benefits of moving forward, continuing to practice virtue and so on. And so again, this is a very powerful mental, mental factor that keeps us uh, in the, the pathway of virtue. And so this chapter we're almost done with. We only have one more verse to go. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start sharing the slides and we'll recap what we already talked about. Again, chapter four was divided into three main parts. The very short explanation, which was the first, a more explanation that we finished off last week, and then a summary verse, which is what we'll be kind of beginning with tonight after I do this introduction. Again, recall that in that middle section, there was uh, meditating on conscientiousness for bodhicitta. Uh, we need to make sure the first three chapters of this text were all about cultivating bodhicitta, first as an aspiration, a wish, and then making it uh, more firm by taking the bodhisattva vows and so on. So having done that in the first three chapters, Master Shantideva is, is encouraging us to be very conscientious around not letting our bodhicitta uh, diminish in any way, making sure that it continues to develop and strengthen. Then we went on to being conscientious in the training Trainings, which again, uh, we looked at these three ways that we can be conscientious. Again, this is what we finished up with last week. The first one had to do with being conscientious around abandoning faults, meaning that we have to stop engaging in non-virtue. 
We have to stop engaging in the things that will lead to problems for ourselves, but moreover will keep us from being able to benefit others because we'll end up in unfortunate states where we can't use those lives as meaningfully as this life that we currently have and we'll end up uh, being thwarted in helping others. And then conscientiously meditating on virtue, the next set of verses, which was about how we need to uh, have those virtuous thoughts, actions, and so on that will assure that we do have a series of good rebirths, that we do have the ability to continue to have more meaningful lives, to continue to develop our minds on the spiritual path. So we went through both of those sections. And then last week, we finished off this last section, conscientiously abandoning the afflictions. Again, recognizing that while for the bodhisattva, the main obstacle isn't the afflictions, the obscurations to liberation, as they're called sometimes. The afflictions are what keep us bound in samsara, but the bodhisattva is intent upon not just transcending samsara and achieving nirvana, achieving a pacification of those afflictions, but is intent upon going to Buddhahood. So even though the Bodhisattva wants to achieve Buddhahood or omniscience, which means we have to remove some subtler obscurations in the mind, the knowledge obscurations, as they're sometimes called, uh, those sort of subtle imprints that are in our minds, that you can't remove those initially. You have to first remove the afflictions. And if we also recognize how the afflictions are harming others, because when they're in our minds, we're not paying attention to others. We're often going about things in a very self-centered way. So we want to abandon the afflictions. Bodhisattvas need to abandon the afflictions. This is kind of where we ended last week, uh, was kind of looking at the verses that help us to do that, to have this conscientiousness around that, that goal. So uh, again, there's that wonderful verse that we sometimes recite at our center here in Santa Fe at the very beginning uh, that is a, an encapsulation of the Buddha's teachings. It says, uh, do not commit any non-virtuous actions. That line is very similar to the first topic here. Commit only perfect virtuous actions. That's the second topic on the screen. Uh, subdue your mind thoroughly. That's the third topic, and that's, of course, what so many of our practices about, even when we get into chapter five tonight, uh, at the very beginning, it talks about how everything is about subduing our minds, making our minds into the practice of the six perfections, as they're called. So this is, again, the essential teaching of the Buddha, to not commit the non-virtue, to commit virtue as much as possible, make sure that we adopt that, and then to do what we can to subdue our own minds. Now we're at the summary verse, again, having completed those first two sections. So we'll be getting into, you know, a whole new chapter tonight after we finish this. This summary verse, again, is Master Shanti Deva saying, after having looked at this whole topic of conscientiousness, therefore, having thought about this, I should make effort for the sake of accomplishing the trainings explained. If the doctor's instructions are ignored, how will a patient in need of treatment be cured by the innocent? You know, they often use this as an analogy for the Dharma, that the Dharma is medicine. Remember, when we talk about the three jewels, we often talk about the Buddha being the perfect doctor who knows the exact illness that we are experiencing and knows everything that needs to be prescribed. And then we have the Dharma, which is the actual medicine that we are uh, prescribed to take. And then, of course, the Sangha, those beings who have already developed some expertise with regard to the medicine who we can rely upon because they're there uh, from their own experience they can help us so again the main of the three jewels the main jewel that we take refuge in is the dharma and if we simply accumulate the dharma and you know know lots of things that we can talk about and we can you know do long discourses on all these various topics but we never take the medicine ourselves we never uh, actually apply the dharma into our lives well then it's kind of pointless. <laughs> what would be the point of, if you had a, a very powerful medicine, say there was a medicine that is known for relieving uh, colds, flus, whatever, all this stuff going around, and you, you said, oh, wow, I've got this really wonderful medicine, but all you did was you keep it in your medicine cabinet. You never take it yourself. When you get sick, you don't take it. None of the time you take it. Well, that would be kind of silly, right? We know that if this medicine is uh, targeting uh, our deepest problem, not just the diseases that we experience, but the deepest problem that we have of being under the control of our karma and delusions, going from life to life in this unenlightened experience, well, then this is medicine we have to take. So again, in that verse, Master Shanti Deva was saying, you know, we can't be cured by the medicine of the Dharma if we don't actually take it. We can't actually transform our minds into complete enlightenment, uh, Buddhahood, unless we engage in the trainings. 
And the trainings, of course, is what's coming up from here on out. And that's what we're going to get into in terms of the transition from this chapter into chapter five and all the following chapters of this text. So I'm going to read a little bit from um, the commentary that I believe most of you have by Gyaltsip J that's translated by Venerable Fedor. He says, contemplate in the above way repeatedly make an effort to strive with conscientiousness in how the Buddha earlier explained bodhicitta and how to protect, protect the trainings. So everything that the Buddha has given in terms of instructions to cultivate bodhicitta, I went through these when we uh, met in New York in October. Um, and so again, all of that instruction is in the stages of the path, the Lam Rim texts. We have to have great confidence that the Buddha taught those for a reason so that we could actually cultivate that mind and begin our bodhisattva trainings and engage in all of this wholeheartedly. So we have to reflect on that repeatedly, on the importance of those teachings. And he says, there are no sicknesses that can be cured only by medicine without listening to the instructions of the physician that contain many truths. We have to kind of listen to the advice on how to apply that medicine, how to take it, when to take it, uh, what, what the ways are that will allow us to make the best use of it. It's the same with regard to the Dharma. You know, just knowing a little bit of Dharma isn't enough. We have to have a wholehearted dedication to applying it in all the various ways throughout our lives. So then he says, strive in abandoning the afflictions according to the instructions of the great physician. And so, again, I think I may, I don't know if I put this verse on the, um, the screen or not. Let me see. I think I did. Let me try to get that up again. Uh, it's a nice little verse that comes from, I'm not sure where this comes from, actually. Uh, no, maybe, I, maybe it's the previous one. Let me go back up. This is a restatement of what page 27 of Gelsip J's commentary that I was reading from. It says, freedom from being sullied by misdeeds and the non-degeneration and increase of virtue are contingent upon the definite cultivation of conscientiousness. Thus, the wise should always have conscientiousness. So this is, again, the Buddha um, apparently, well, actually, this is from Gyaltsip uh, Tamche Kenpa, who may actually be, that, that, that is a verse by Gyaltsip J. That's why it's in our commentary. It's not as attributed to anyone else. It's actually from Gyaltsip J. So I, I pulled that translation from a translation of A Precious Garland, which is the abbot Drakpa Gyaltsin's commentary on this text that we're going through, Shanti Deva's text. And he says in introducing that verse, with conscientiousness of the three, what are called the three doors, our door of our body, physical actions, our speech, our verbal actions, and the door of the mind, all of the things we do mentally, you should strive diligently in the practice of the six perfections, the great summation that condenses all the deeds of the victor's children. And that's because, again, of what that verse said, because we will be able to do that if we are conscientious. We will be able to not have misdeeds, to avoid all the non-virtue, to increase our virtue and make that, you know, continue to develop uh, along the path. But that's always dependent upon our conscientiousness. And conscientiousness being that factor of the mind that keeps us on track, that kind of has that, uh, that desire to keep the faults in mind, to keep the benefits in mind, and thereby to progress uh, towards virtue. So now we're going to go ahead and enter into chapter five. Again, I will hopefully get into some of the verses, but there is a little bit of an introduction to this chapter, and that's because we're getting into, as I said, the rest of the text that deals with the six perfections. So there is some uh, peripheral material that I do want to go through that talks about the six perfections, and even in Gelsip J's commentary, which again, if you do have that in front of you, hopefully uh, you do. The, the section on chapter five, uh, the outlines for this begin on page five, and you'll see that there's a, oh, I'm sorry, not page five, uh, earlier. <laughs> I had it open to page five and thought that's where it started, page one. Um, you'll see that there's this initial uh, kind of what this chapter is about. It's called guarding introspection or guarding alertness in some texts. Uh, the topic for this chapter is explaining the way of training in morality by relating it to introspection and mindfulness. I'm going to talk about those two factors a little bit later tonight. And then the, it continues, the, the title of this, uh, these two, introspection and mindfulness, the methods to keeping virtuous dharma pure. So we have an introduction to these two mental factors that again we'll, we'll be discussing, but they are very useful tools in helping us to stay 
especially in regard to the practice of our morality, our ethics. This chapter is primarily focused on our ethical behavior and the things we need to do to uphold good ethical behavior. So it's a little bit similar to the previous chapter, except it's coming from a different angle. Rather than looking at the conscientiousness that is this underlying uh, state of mind, it's looking at the actual tools that we use in the moment. Again, these two of introspection and mindfulness. So there is a general presentation from Gyaltsev J that doesn't have any verses associated with it. And then we'll actually get into the meat of the text. There's uh, 109 verses in this uh, and will be broken up into a number of uh, sections. Whoops, sorry, I hit the wrong button there. General presentation, this first part of it, again, without any verses has three outlines. The first outline, why it is necessary to cultivate the training. So again, we're on page one of Gelsip J's and I decided to go ahead uh, this tune so that we can just see it. Uh, Gelsip J says, merely generating the wishing mind has of course great benefits, but it is impossible to attain enlightenment without making the perfections the essence of one's practice. Hence, one should engage into the practice of the perfections. So again, the main topic we're going to be looking at tonight is introducing these six perfections or what are called paramitas in the Sanskrit. Um, this is the, the practice of the bodhisattva, the main deeds of the bodhisattva. So again, we saw this previously when we were even talking about it in the first chapter uh, when Shantideva introduced these two different uh, minds of bodhicitta the wishing mind or the aspiring mind, where we have that intention to go to enlightenment for the sake of others, and then the engaging mind, uh, the engaging or practical mind of bodhicitta is the mind that actually takes us into the activities by taking the vows, by uh, engaging in the six perfections and so on, one is able to then progress to that actual goal. You know, and recall that Master Shanti Deva said, you know, that the difference between these two is like the first one is the wish to go somewhere. So say you always wanted to go to India and you haven't been to India, you can have that aspiration in the back of your mind. That's like reminding yourself occasionally, oh, I would really love to go to India. I'd really love to see all the holy sites in India and what have you. But you never make any effort to go there. So again, if you, if that's a wonderful aspiration to have, but it doesn't really get legs and move somewhere until you actually make the determination to go there. That's the engaging mind, the mind that says, okay, I'm gonna buy my ticket and I'm gonna make my plans and I'm gonna determine where I'm going and how long I'm spending in each place. And then you actually get on the plane and go there, you know, and you see all the sights and what have you. Well, again, the aspirational mind is what led you to engage in that, but you need the engaging mind if you're gonna take it beyond just an aspiration. So there are two verses then, I didn't put these on the slides that, uh, Gelsip J then cites, one is from the King of Concentration Sutra. Uh, the Buddha says there, youth therefore make practice the essence. I shall explain why. For someone that makes practice the essence, the attainment of highest enlightenment is not difficult. This is kind of a reassuring verse. It's kind of essentially telling us if we practice what the Buddha said, and especially in terms of the six perfections, the ways that we engage in bodhicitta, then it, it won't be difficult at all to achieve the result. You know, if we put the causes into place, then the result will ensue. This is uh, one of the most core teachings of the Buddha, his whole teaching on cause and effect, dependent arising, that things arise in dependence upon their causes and conditions. Enlightenment too arises in dependence upon its causes and conditions. And the main ones, of course, are bodhicitta, having developed that aspiration, but then engaging in the activities of a bodhisattva, which once more is where we're moving into in terms of these remaining chapters. And it says also from the initial stages of meditation, which is Kamala Shila's text, uh, the first of his three texts on the stages of meditation. He says, thus bodhisattvas that have generated bodhicitta, after having understood the subdued and the unsubdued, need to strongly engage into the teachings of practicing generosity and so forth. Without practice, they will not attain enlightenment. This is kind of looking at it from the other side that, yeah, you have to engage in these teachings because if you don't create the causes, you won't experience the result. Enlightenment only comes to those who actually engage in these trainings. So we're going to be looking at these six perfections because these six perfections are the core of the bodhisattva's practice. Um, so practice, uh, Gyaltsev J says then at the bottom of the screen after those two verses, those two citations, 
also refers to the advice concerning the vows after one has taken them. Of course, because, you know, it's not just engaging in the practice of the actual perfections, it's following the guidelines that the vows give in terms of bodhisattva behavior. So I won't be going into all of the vows as part of this course. Uh, there are a number of texts out there where you can study them. The FPMT has a little booklet that gives the basics of uh, following the avoiding the 18 root downfalls and not engaging in the 46 branch vows or transgressions, you know, that are kind of subsequent to those, uh, kind of an addendum to those. So then Gelsip J goes on to the second outline of these three under the general presentation, training in method and wisdom separately will not lead to enlightenment. So here, um, before we get into this, I'll just mention, I, I'm sure most of you have heard this teaching. Venerable Rabina cites this frequently. It's from the Buddha's teachings, and I think Master Chandra Kirti used it in one of the texts that we studied in Italy at the master's program. This whole idea of the two wings of a bird, you know, we hear this frequently. You know, a bird that wants to go to its destination is not going to be able to arrive without both wings. Both wings are involved in flight and in taking the bird to that destination. Well, it's the same with regard to enlightenment. If we kind of call down the path to like two essential components, we have what's called method. Method being everything that sort of puts the fuel in the tank, that creates all the positive potential, that is essentially based in compassion, rooted in compassion. Sometimes this wing is even called the wing of compassion. But it's compassionate method is where we unite all of our actions with bodhicitta and we keep putting that sort of positive potential so that we have the energy to get us to the destination. The other side is wisdom. That wing is essential because the primary thing that is keeping us from removing either of those obstructions I talked about earlier, either the obstructions to liberation, the afflictions and so on, or the obstructions to omniscience, Buddhahood, which are the imprints of our ignorance that are giving rise to a false appearance, a dualistic appearance. If we want to get rid of either of those, you need the wisdom realizing emptiness, which we'll see again in the ninth chapter. The ninth chapter is on the perfection of wisdom. Uh, if and when we get to that, we will you know, be able to pursue those teachings that Master Shanti Deva gives on that topic. That is the essence of the perfections in terms of the branch of wisdom or the wing of wisdom. The wing of method is primarily the first f uh, three or four, depending upon who's presenting it. And then you have the fifth paramita of concentration that is certainly used as a support for wisdom. But we'll get into this as we go through tonight. But these perfections are included within these two branches, what we call method and wisdom. So let's go back then to the, the text and see what uh, Gelsip J has to say about this. He says, the method for attaining enlightenment that one engages in must be an unmistaken method. A mistaken method will not bring about the desired result, although one engages into effort. So a mistaken method be, would be one that uh, somehow doesn't give us the correct teachings in either method or wisdom, or somehow, again, is giving us wrong advice about practicing them, that we won't be able to unite those two. You know, that they will stay somewhat separate. They won't have the potential. Uh, the Buddha teaches an unmistaken path. And of course, Master Shantideva is, is, is explaining this unmistaken path to us. So this is one aspect of it, is that we need to have a method that is unmistaken, a technique, a path that will get us there because it's proven to be true, to be accurate and correct. But then he says one's effort will also not bring about a result. The engaged method is incomplete, even though it is unmistaken. So while we might have uh, perfect teachings that we're following, if the teachings don't tell us how to get to the full destination, to how to unite these factors and to assure that we're going to achieve enlightenment, we, we need that, uh, that factor. It won't get, we won't get to the result, even though what we're following is unmistaken. So the final point of this uh, initial part of this section is, therefore, one needs to train in a complete, unmistaken method. We need to have both method and wisdom emphasized. We need to have complete and unmistaken teachings on both of them. And then we can integrate them both into a path that will lead to the state of Buddhahood. And then there's a citation that Gelsip J does from what's called the text, it's called the Purification of Arachana. Uh, this is uh, the transcendental wisdom that knows all, the keeper of the secret, 
arisen from the root of compassion, arisen from the cause of bodhicitta, is the culmination of method. So here, the, this translation is using the idea of method as the bringing, to, bringing both of those together. The transcendental wisdom, which is the one wing of the bird that knows all, that is kind of a, a understanding the nature of all existence at the deepest level. Uh, you know, the, the keeper of the secret, the knowing that information in the most um, uh, wise way, complete way. And it arises from the root of compassion, from the cause of bodhicitta, which is the uh, method side of it, the compassionate side of it. So this is the culmination of method, is when we are able to bring those two together and not practice them separately, have a complete and unmistaken path. As quoted, one goes beyond through great compassion, conventional and ultimate bodhicitta, and the method of generosity and the other perfections. So this is the last sentence in this section. I do want to talk about this term that's used of ultimate bodhicitta. You know, I think we did talk about that even in the course again when we were um, uh, in, when I was in New York. Ultimate bodhicitta being the um, union of that mind of bodhicitta that the bodhisattva has, the, com the compassionate motivation of a bodhisattva with the wisdom realizing emptiness. But there are, again, uh, practitioners who, of Buddhism who are not bodhisattvas, those who practice the individual vehicle, the Hinayana, that leads to their own liberation from samsara. Their realizations of emptiness, we wouldn't call ultimate bodhicitta. We would simply call them a direct realization of emptiness, wonderful accomplishment. But for a bodhisattva, they are uniting their bodhicitta motivation, that compassionate motivation, with the wisdom realizing emptiness. We call that ultimate bodhicitta, because it is knowing the ultimate truth, the wisdom realizing emptiness. So this is the idea behind that, is that you know, when we combine those two, as is said in, in this uh, um, kind of commentary on that verse from Gelsip J, the, the, the text that was the purification of Arachana, that, that, that quote, he says, one goes beyond to the state of Buddhahood through great compassion, conventional and ultimate bodhicitta. Of course, great compassion being the root of our conventional bodhicitta, the wish to become a Buddha and so on. Uh, and then ultimate bodhicitta, the realization of emptiness that is supported by that. And the method of generosity and the other perfections. You know, all of that that informs also the method side of it. Uh, again, the other perfections uh, being those that are... Um, uh, we'll be going through in text generosity kind of interesting generosity doesn't have its own chapter in this I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that when we go through uh, the six perfections so the third outline of this general presentation is called the sequence of cultivating the trainings here we're on page two and Yeltsin J says upon taking the wishing bodhicitta again that aspirational mind one trains in the aspiration to engage into the trainings. Following this, one, the, one then takes the bodhisattva vows and practices the trainings accordingly. So recall again that those are those two states of bodhicitta that are both in the category of conventional bodhicitta, initially the aspirational mind that wishes to move to enlightenment to that state so we can help others and then the engaging in the trainings by taking the vows and practicing them accordingly. If the different types of trainings are summed up in accordance with the ornament of Mahayana Sutras, then they are the six perfections. So this is where we're going to kind of go into a deeper investigation of the six perfections. The six perfections, uh, first I want to talk about why they're called that. And so I'm quoting here from a book by Geshe Sonam Rinchen. This actually isn't in the handout that you have for this course. I apologize for not putting that in there. I kind of realized later that I didn't have that this information in there. Um, but anyway, uh, I can get this at a later time. Um, Maybe even at some point I can provide you with all these slides that I'm using, though most of what's in the slides is either in the text that you have, the root text, the root verses, or is in Gelsip J's commentary. But this is from, again, Geshe Sonam's, Sonam Rinchen's book on these paramitas. He says the Tibetan words, which are translated as perfection, which is parotupinpa, which is sometimes abbreviated to parjin, uh, mean gone beyond you know, that this idea of we've transcended, we've gone beyond our, uh, the ordinary world, the mundane world, to this state of enlightenment. 
These practices are called perfections because they are practiced by bodhisattvas with the supreme intention of attaining enlightenment for the sake of all living beings. A bodhisattva's practice of the perfection gives rise to complete enlightenment as beyond both worldly existence and personal peace, in which generosity, the first, ethical discipline, the second, patience, the third, enthusiastic effort, the fourth, concentration, the fifth, and then finally the sixth, wisdom, have been perfected. Thus, the cause is called by the name of the result. So this is a, a, a you know a, a sort of an etymology or explanation of why they're called perfections, why they're called parchin in Tibetan is because the idea is, is that you will attain that state of having gone beyond that state of perfection when they are fully culminated. That result, we're going to give that name to the actual cause. Your practice of the perfections in, in your unenlightened state is what causes them to eventually arise in the resultant state of the perfected uh, state of being of a Buddha. The practice of the perfections, he goes on to say, takes one to the other shore beyond the ocean of psych existence state in which the two kinds of obstructions, again, I mentioned these previously, those to liberation formed by the disturbing attitudes and emotions, what we often call the, the afflictions, and secondly, those which prevent complete knowledge of all phenomena, omniscience. Both of those have been completely eliminated. So that's what we mean by the final state, of course, is when you've removed both sets of obstructions and attained that perfection. So the, it's the practice of the perfection that results in you going to that other shore, to that state uh, that is well beyond samsara, but yet again, not totally removed from samsara because Buddhas still stay engaged in samsara, emanating to beings uh, to help them on the path. So let's just briefly look at these. This is on your handout. Uh, again, the handouts were sent out um, when we started the course, and hopefully any of you who joined the course have gotten that. If you haven't, then again, please contact uh, the person who's kind of coordinating it for you, either in Miami or New York, and I'm sure they will get these to you. If uh, They may even be out on websites. I'm not sure where they are. Um, the very first one, this is Jetson Choki Gelson. Jet Jetson Choki Gelson was the textbook writer for Sarah J. Monastery, uh, lived a few centuries ago, and his book, Ocean of Sport, which is a commentary on the text by my that we studied in the master's program, he gives a very brief definition of each of these. Generosity is the intention to give its, its very essence. It also includes certainly the acts of giving physically, you know, through our speech, whatever it is that we do. But it's essentially the mind that is the intention to give. Ethics or morality, the second perfection, is the intention to abandon misdeeds. And that's the main topic of this chapter that we're going into after we get through this preliminary exploration of the six perfections. Patience, uh, you know, invaluable quality to have in our minds, which is essentially defined as an undisturbed mind, a mind that is not disturbed by the harm that we receive or by the suffering we have to experience uh, or even by the, the trials and tribulations of applying the Dharma and practicing it in our lives. We, we have that kind of undisturbed mind all the time when we have the mind of patience. Joyous effort, the fourth of the perfections, is a mind that delights in virtue, you know, that feels really joyous and happy to be engaging in dharma practice and moving our minds in that direction. This is a very important factor. Concentration, a knower that arises from meditation, distinguished by a mind abiding single-pointedly on a virtuous observed object. Again, there's extensive instruction for attaining that state of mind in the Lam Rim text, the stages of the path text, but this is a very deep state of concentration where we are able to stay with a virtuous object for as long as we wish uh, and remain there without any distraction. Um, the final perfection is a knower thoroughly discriminating phenomena, both discriminating conventional phenomena as well as, of course, the ultimate phenomena, uh, the emptiness of all things of inherent existence. And these are set out, they say, in, this, in the order of them being 
uh, the easiest to practice to the most difficult to practice. Now, it doesn't mean that every one of us are going to find that to be true for us individually, but they say that it's good to maybe begin with generosity because it's a very simple practice to engage in, and we can start by giving small and eventually, you know, or even just again cultivate the intention to give, as is explained here, and then eventually we do start giving physically, verbally to others, and then our practice of ethics becomes more important, and then we also need to practice patience, which is obviously a very difficult mind to cultivate. Um, and then joyous effort, uh, the enthusiasm that it takes to persevere in our practice. Concentration obviously takes a lot of uh, time and energy to develop that deep state of mind and then wisdom to actually discern the nature of reality and then to also eventually know all conventional things. So these are set out in that uh, order generally. Um, the next thing that is um, explained in terms of this outline that we're looking at in Gyaltsup this third outline of the general presentation, the sequence of cultivating the trainings, is that it said here in the, in the page two of your, your commentary that the six perfections are the definite number from the point of view of these six things. And they don't correlate one to one. It's not like the first one, generosity is higher status. No, these are, these are six ways that we can look at the six perfections so that we end up being convinced that they're complete. They're definite in terms of providing us with all the instruction for all six of these things. First, to attain higher status, which means to gain a rebirth that is good, that is wholesome, that has all the, the qualities that we need to use it well. Secondly, to accomplish the two purposes. The two purposes are the benefit of others, accomplishing their welfare, as well as the welfare of oneself. Again, because we have to develop ourselves to actually accomplish the welfare of others. The third one is the complete achievement of the welfare of others, to be able to do that fully, to be able to complete uh, our desire to benefit others most uh, directly, uh, fulfill their aims. The fourth one is that it should contain or comprise the entire Mahayana, that all of the practices of the Mahayana path, the Bodhisattva path, should be included within those six perfections. It's definite in that regard. It's also definite or uh, complete in terms of teaching, as we saw earlier, the importance of a complete path or method, something that will actually take us the full distance, that will help us to accomplish everything we need to to achieve enlightenment. And then finally, it, also ha it has to encompass the three higher trainings, the three higher trainings being uh, the training in ethical discipline, which is the foundational training, the training in concentration, which is built upon having good ethical discipline. And then finally, the teachings, uh, the training in wisdom. Uh, the training in wisdom has to be built upon a mind of concentration, which again is dependent upon having good ethical discipline. So in terms of these six, um, I did ask uh, the folks in New York, as well as uh, uh, in Miami, to send out a handout to those who they knew were kind of registered and coming. And I don't know if you were able to get it or not, or get access to it. I'm not going to go through all of it, but it's a little handout that I put together when I taught on the middle length Lam Rim here in Santa Fe back in, looks like 2010, some time ago, 10 years ago. And I went back and reviewed it briefly, but I don't think there were any major changes. I did notice one little typo that made it in um, after I had sent it off to them. But, but essentially, uh, this is a, a little grid uh, chart that I put together that has uh, at the top, these six categories uh, going across each column high status, accomplishing the two welfares, complete achievement or accomplishment of the welfare of others in all aspects, comprising the entire Mahayana and so on. And then on the left-hand side, in terms of the rows, are each of the six perfections. So you'll get a taste for this. Let me, let me just go through the first one in terms of high status. And you can then maybe digest this on your own. It's not a topic that is explored beyond what's on page two of Gelsip J's commentary, but it kind of gives us a, a real appreciation for how the six perfections are a real masterful way of the Buddha having laid out everything that we need for all six of these things to happen, for us to get a life that is very uh, meaningful and purposeful in terms of high status, a uh, human existence, where we can use that life well uh, and to accomplish both the welfare of oneself and others and so on, all these various things that are listed there. So in terms of high status, again, in my uh, chart, I've got a little quote there. It says, bodhisattvas need to have many consecutive lives with a support complete in all features, along with all excellences. 
This is the truth for most of us, right? You know, as much as we are dedicated to this path in this lifetime, it's probably the rare individual who will actually be able to accomplish enlightenment in this life. You know, I'm not trying to, to discourage you by saying that. By all means, put all the energy that you can into your practice. But recognize that for most people, it's hard to have all the conditions in one lifetime and to kind of use those to achieve complete enlightenment. It is possible to do that, especially through the tantric path. But nonetheless, most of us are going to need a consecutive series of good rebirths so that we can accomplish that fully. And so in terms of that, for generosity, the very first of the six perfections, what does it help you to achieve in terms of high status? It's the first of what are called the four excellences. To initially attain the four excellences, we need resources at our disposal. Well, where do resources come from? Resources come from our own generosity. And as I mentioned earlier, generosity doesn't have its own chapter in this text. It's essentially taught, we looked at a little bit of generosity, I think, earlier on in, in uh, one of the earlier chapters, but it's uh, primarily said to be taught in chapter 10 when we have the dedication of the merit, when we think about dedicating that merit for the welfare of all beings. That's where there's those wonderful verses that uh, His Holiness uses frequently in his dedications about you know, all sentient beings being able to benefit from everything that's done virtuous by ourselves and others and so on. But anyway, giving is the means by which we achieve resources. You know, if we give material resources, then that ripens into our receiving material resources. Not just you know showing up magically at our door. Obviously, there are causes and conditions, but every one of us has created the causes and conditions to have the resources we have in our lives through our past generosity. Well, why do you want resources? Well, for one thing, it's good to have them because we actually then can have more leisure to practice the Dharma. If we had to spend all of our days out trying to you know grow the food that we need to eat and you know find the water that we need to drink and spend a lot of energy and effort just to sustain our lives because we lack resources then we wouldn't be able to make as good a use of that life as we could if we did have those resources moreover the bodhisattva wants to use those resources to benefit others even Master Shantideva, he has a very similar story to many of these great Indian masters and even the Buddha himself. He was from a very rich family, a palace, you know, and had all of these things at his disposal. You know, and of course, he left all that behind to live a monastic life and what have you. But nonetheless, you know, if you do get born into that type of existence where you're inheriting lots of resources, you have lots that you can work with, well, then how wonderful. You can benefit so many others. But you got those resources through your past karma, not because you won the lottery by being born to people who had money. You know, everything is karmically determined. So anyway, I'm going to not to explain each of these quite as extensively, but that's the very first one is recognizing that we need resources at our disposal in order to have a, a rebirth with these four excellences. The second excellence is to have a body with which to practice, of course, which is the main result that we want to achieve through our virtuous activity. By abandoning killing, abandoning stealing, and so on, all of these virtuous actions, you're planting the seeds for a good rebirth, a rebirth where you will be reborn as a human, as you are now, and be able to use that body, that support in a meaningful way, or perhaps even in the God realms where there are some God realms where there are, are access, there's access to teachings and so on. But the human rebirth is one that's primarily emphasized because the human existence is a very important one, especially from the point of view of Tantra. You know, that in this tantric uh, perspective, what we have in a human body are these subtle energies and subtle pathways that we can utilize uh, using tantric methods to achieve enlightenment. But in the sutra presentation, it's primarily meaning any body that will be useful for us to be able to practice the Dharma. And we gain that through ethical discipline, through avoiding non-virtue and engaging in virtue. Then there's patience. Uh, patience has the result of the third excellence, companions with whom to practice, you know, giving us people that we uh, will support us on our path, that we can practice with, that we can enjoy the Dharma with. Uh, so this is an important thing. Now, how does it do that? Patience, of course, when you practice patience with others, that means you're not getting upset with them. You're not angering them. You're not harming them through your mind of anger. So in essence, you're creating a bond with others, harmony with others, and therefore they actually even say that it manifests in having a nice face, a beautiful appearance. You know, everyone who's born in this world with some 
sort of uh, attractive appearance. Again, attraction is obviously in the eye of the person who's beholding uh, that person. Uh, it's not to say that there's any definiteness or inherent attractiveness or unattractiveness, but having a pleasing appearance is often the product of a mind of patience, having practiced that in the past. So when you do that, you then also are creating harmony with others, a more pleasing disposition to be with others. The fourth of the excellences is that work that you are able to accomplish uh, once undertaken. So you accomplish the work that you set out to the tasks that you want to do, the trainings you want to engage in, uh, be, uh, because you've done that in the past. Once you undertake a particular task through the enthusiasm that you've cultivated in the past, it will ripen into your ability to persevere, to do what needs to be done. So if we have those four excellences present, you know, we have all the resources that enable us to use it, uh, a life meaningfully, the actual human existence or higher existence itself. We have the uh, pleasing friends around us that are drawn to us because of having practiced patience. And then we also have the ability to get what needs to be done done through our joyous effort then it's important that we use that, having attained that, and if you have that in this life right now, which most of you do, then you can essentially look at it and say, okay, I have these excellences right now. Therefore, the, set, the next one, the fifth box down, says to not come under the power of the mental afflictions in relation to those excellences. In other words, to not let one's mind become caught up in attachment to all the resources we do have or to the uh, you know, other aspects of this existence. So how do you do that through practicing concentration? Concentration is putting the mind, again, single-pointedly, stabilizing it on a single object. They say by doing that, you won't allow the afflictions to arise. You know, that being in that state of meditation keeps them from arising because you're single-pointedly focused on an object of virtue. So this is a force that we need to cultivate so that we don't have the afflictions arising in regard to the four excellences that we possess in this life right now. Then finally, the sixth one. Uh, here we engage in the, the perfection of wisdom so that we can distinguish well the observed objects that are to be unmistakably engaged in and turned, uh, turn away from. So uh, you know, both of those, to, those that are need to be engaged in unmistakably and those that need to be turned away from. So the excellences don't destroy themselves. You know, so again, our, our wisdom here can be both conventional knowledge, which means understanding clearly the law of cause and effect, karma, following it well so that we assure we don't mess up this human life that we have, this one time that we come out of the lower realms and we have this amazing existence. Again, it's not just one time, but it feels like it's one time because we may have been many, many lifetimes between the last time uh, we had that type of existence in this time. But nonetheless, we have to make sure we don't destroy it through ha not having the conventional wisdom that will help us to make good use of this life. But moreover, to use this life to realize the ultimate wisdom, the wisdom of emptiness that will help us to transcend samsara, to transcend our unenlightened state and be able to use this life in the most meaningful way. So again, I'm not going to go through the other ones because I think it would it's really more topic for middle length long rim studies, but you should have that again. If you don't, please contact the person who you're working with uh, from either of those two centers, uh, Namdor Lang uh, study group or uh, Shanti Deva center. The other topics again, just go through and do a similar thing. They show how the practice of each of these perfections helps us to accomplish both welfares, either the welfare of others or the welfare of oneself, uh, to accomplish the welfare of others completely in terms of being able to help all beings in the best way possible, and so on. So this is, again, just something that Gelsip J didn't go into, but I thought it would be remiss of me not to give you at least something to work with in regard to what was said on, uh, again, this slide here, these six perfections being definite in number from the point of view of each of these various things that are all important aspects of our path. Now, Gelsip J, I don't know if this is from Gelsip J's text or not. Venerable Fedor has included on page two and over to page three, uh, a number of kind of an overview of the sick perfections. And I thought we'd just go through this very briefly. I don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but at least um, explain uh, each of these to some degree. We're going to go into most of them to quite a, in a quite a bit of detail. 
first the cause of these uh, kind of where they arise from, um, the nature of them, the divisions within each, and the meaning of the name. Uh, this is sometimes looking at the Sanskrit name, but nonetheless, kind of how the name, uh, the etymology of that fits into what the practice is. And then finally, the results from them. So in terms of cause, there's just a, a single uh, statement here that Gautzup J. made. It says, it is bodhicitta that is held by method and will, again, those two wings, and focuses on the three baskets of Mahayana teachings, independence uh, on the, maybe they should say on, and I, again, I was copying what Venerable Federer had there, but I do notice that there are a few typos in his. It might be independence on the special Mahayana lineage and the condition of a Mahayana teacher. So let's look at what's all in this. Uh, it says bodhicitta, again, the main cause of these six perfections is bodhicitta. Bodhicitta, again, is what we unite with any of these practices that makes it into a perfection. It makes it into a practice of a bodhisattva. Because anyone can engage in generosity, right? There are many people in the world right now who are being very generous with their resources, but they may not have bodhicitta motivation. So we can't call their practice of generosity a perfection because it's not together with the mind of bodhicitta. But that bodhicitta specifically is held by these two aspects of method and wisdom the compassionate wing of method and the wisdom that is the understanding of things conventionally and ultimately. And it focuses on the three baskets of Mahayana teachings. Of course, the Mahayana teachings mirror the, those of the Hinayana in terms of being uh, the three baskets that are correlated to the three higher trainings I mentioned earlier. Uh, first of all, the Vinaya, which is the uh, basket of teachings that the Buddha gave on discipline, on ethical behavior. Then we have the Sutra, which is a basket within the discourses of the Buddha that deals with concentration and how to develop concentration. And then the third basket is what's called Abhidharma. Abhidharma, or sometimes translated as manifest knowledge, are the teachings on wisdom. So the three higher trainings of ethical discipline, morality, uh, concentration, and wisdom are mirrored in what are called the three baskets. The three baskets, you probably have heard this term before, of the teachings are how you could summarize all, th uh, all of what the Buddha taught in terms of these three main practices, the Vinaya for our morality, the Sutra for our developing concentration, and the Abhidharma for developing wisdom. But these you know, teachings, again, and this is all done, it focuses on these teachings in dependence on the special Mahayana lineage, what we might call, again, our awakening of Buddha nature through having generated this great compassion, this desire to benefit others that has been awakened in all of you, you know, to some degree by virtue of your interest in these teachings. And moreover, the condition of a Mahayana teacher you know, this also, we uh, engage in this uh, method and wisdom on the basis of having a Mahayana teacher to instruct us, to help us on this path. Again, that being the very first topic that is taught in the Lam Rim in terms of the meditation topics, uh, the relating to, relying upon a spiritual friend, uh, a Mahayana guru who can lead us on this path. So this is, in essence, all of what's behind it. The main one, of course, the main cause is that very first one that's mentioned, bodhicitta that's held by method and wisdom, focusing on these and so on, you know, has all these different conditions that have led to that bodhicitta being there. The nature, the nature of generosity is the virtuous mind of giving and all the actions of body and speech that arise from it. So whereas on your handout, you had that very abbreviated definition of generosity, the intention to give, it says here that it's not just that virtuous mind of giving, but it's also, as I said earlier, all the actions of body and speech that arise from it. Uh, morality, the second, or ethics as it's sometimes referred to, is contained in the thought of abandoning harm to others and abandoning soul personal liberation. Of course, this is because this is part of our bodhisattva ethic. Uh, those who practice the Hinayana path are wanting to achieve their soul personal liberation. But for bodhisattvas, this would be a real um, unethical thing to do, you know, to decide, oh, I'm going to just simply attain my own solitary peace as those who practice the path of the Hinayana, the individual vehicle, uh, they aspire to do that to simply be free from their own suffering. 
and how wonderful that we can have one less suffering being in the world. But the Bodhisattva wants to go beyond that, doesn't want to get enticed by personal liberation, and instead wants to continue to be uh, dedicated to benefiting all beings completely uh, through practicing the Bodhisattva path and achieving Buddhahood. So it's not just abandoning the thought of harming others, but in this explanation, it's abandoning any thoughts that would lead one to an inferior motivation, a lesser motivation of uh, achieving just one's own liberation. Patience is a mind that abides in its natural state, unaffected by harm and suffering, and that also strongly abides on the Dharma. So as I said, ethics side had ethics. That's going to be the topic of chapter five. Chapter six is going to be on patience. Uh, patience once more is that undisturbed mind, that mind that is is in a sort of natural state where you're not being affected by the harm that you experience from others, by the suffering you have to endure in this life, and that also strong abides in the dharma. It's discouraged and angry and upset at the things we have to engage in to turn the mind around, to get the mind and uh, all of our behavior in more in line with the dharma. Chapter seven, we'll be dealing with enthusiasm or joyous effort. Here it's described as the joy in accumulating virtue. Again, we saw it earlier as described simply as delight in virtue. And uh, accumulating virtue and achieving the purpose of sentient beings and the actions of the three doors that arise from it. So enthusiasm becomes pretty pervasive in terms of our practice. It can be adapted to anything that we do, and it's needed for everything that we do. Uh, this delight in virtue that keeps us on the path, it keeps us accumulating the positive potential by benefiting others, being dedicated to their welfare. All the actions that we engage in on the bodhisattva path uh, are united to some degree with this factor of enthusiasm or effort. Uh, chapter eight uh, that we'll get to eventually will deal with mental stabilization or concentration, which again, this is an even shorter description than what we saw earlier from Jetson uh, Choki Geltsen. Here it's just described as the single pointed abiding on a virtuous object. So again, this is uh, usually described in more detail as sort of a, an undistracted mind that is able to abide as long as it wishes, you know, on an object of virtue. So again, that's essentially what we mean by the mind of calm abiding. Calm abiding, many of you know from your studies of the Lam Rim, it's taught in the section on the great scope, the person of the highest uh, motivation in terms of this sixth perfection, a more extensive explanation of how to develop that deeper state of mind. And we'll get some instruction on that in chapter eight. Chapter nine, we'll be focusing on wisdom. Wisdom is the discerning that occurs upon analyzing ultimate and conventional objects. As I mentioned, we haven't talked about the perfection of wisdom, solely the ultimate, knowing and then you'll hear perfection of wisdom frequently referred to in that context. But when we talk about a, bodhis a bodhisattva's wisdom, as well as what it culminates in terms of the Buddha, the state of the of Buddhahood, it's knowing both conventional and ultimate. A Buddha's mind is omniscient, knowing all objects that exist, all phenomena. And so that means everything that exists conventionally, albeit you know only existing through uh, designation, through mere imputation, as well as everything that exists ultimately, which is the emptiness of all those objects. So then we go on to another category in this uh, brief presentation that Venerable Fedor put in here. Again, I don't know if it's Jay's or not, but he gives the divisions of these. Uh, generosity, as I mentioned, we don't really have a chapter for that other than chapter 10, where there's a dedication verses and what have you. But generally, generosity is taught in terms of three or four divisions. Here we have the three, uh, giving the Dharma, giving material things, resources to others. Uh, and then of course, giving fearlessness, protection from harm, from danger. Uh, again, I'm not gonna go into all of these in great detail. I just wanna briefly survey these so that we can move on to the text. Morality has the morality of vows, uh, meaning to uphold our, uh, our intention to refrain from misbehavior uh, in, in line with the vows that we've taken. Uh, and it also would include refraining from any non-virtuous behavior. Accumulating virtue, which means to uh, accumulate the positive potential through our, our good actions. And then of course, achieving the welfare of others. This is uh, in particular Bodhisattva, very important that we also have to have that mind uh, that of others to do what we can help them 
whether they're sick, uh, in need of resources, in need of uh, whatever, help of whatever type. Patience has three divisions. The patience of thinking nothing of being harmed by others. In other words, we don't get upset when others harm us. Uh, tolerating one's own suffering, where we, when we're sick, when we're uh, having a bad day, whatever, that we just are able to be with it without having the mind of anger arise. And then definitely abiding in the Dharma. As I said, staying with our practice of the Dharma in spite of whatever hardships or difficulties we might have to endure. Enthusiasm. Uh, which is the fourth perfection, has three divisions, armor-like enthusiasm, which is this, it's called armor-like because it's kind of what you uh, put around your mind so that you are always trying to put effort in the Dharma all the time, kind of having wearing the armor of this joyous enthusiasm. Enthusiasm in, accum in accumulating virtue, similar to what we saw for ethics or morality, and enthusiasm in achieving the welfare of sentient beings. So we have to have that kind of perseverance and unbridled engagement in uh, accumulating virtue and helping others. Mental stabilization has mental stabilis to abide in happiness in this life for achieving qualities and for accomplishing the welfare of sentient beings. So again, uh, there is a uh, mental stabilizations that you can attain that will produce a much better experience in this life. That's one division of it. Uh, we also, of course, want to achieve qualities on the basis of that to deepen our insight and awareness. And of course, we also want to have the concentration that helps us to uh, know more clearly and help uh, accomplish the welfare of sentient beings. And then wisdom, finally, was the, the wisdom that realizes the ultimate, which is the truth of emptiness, the conventional, which is the relative truth of all the other things that exist, and the actions for the benefit of sentient beings, the wisdom that knows how we can best benefit others. So again, in the Lam Ram text, they go into much more detail on each of these, but um, this is all that uh, um, Venerable Federer, or again, Gyaltsev J put in this on um, page three of the commentary that you have. This briefly meaning of the name, once more, this is kind of an etymology. So in Sanskrit, the word dana means to give up that to be offered, hence generosity. So it means to take what one is offered or what one receives and to give it up, to allow one's to be simply a conduit for these resources to go to another. Shila, shila, uh, the Sanskrit word means cooling, to kind of cool the heat. They often uh, refer to that as like the moon is like the, the shila, the cooling energy at night, especially in India and in the heat of the day and whatever. It's very nice in the evening when the moon sort of cools things. Of course, the moon isn't really cooling things. It's the whole process of not being in the sun. And so the earth cools down. But nonetheless, that's oftentimes how it's referred to. So Sheila, cooling the heat, uh, means to it cools the misery of the afflictions. You know, so then that's what we mean by morality is to not have the miserable effects of being under the control of the afflictions through our actions, our misbehavior, rather having the cooling uh, effect of the more virtuous states of mind. Patience, because of being patient with aggression. It's kind of interesting. They went for whatever reason away from the, um, the Sanskrit terms. Uh, but patience means that we have to be patient with whatever aggression we receive, whatever suffering we receive. Enthusiasm, because of training for the highest, because it's the highest goal, we need an enthusiastic effort to get there. Mental stabilization, because of mentally holding, you know, holding on to the object, keeping our mind in that undisturbed state. And then finally, wisdom, because of knowing the ultimate, because of knowing uh, the tr ultimate truth of reality. And then the final topic that's talked about in this little introduction to the six perfections are the results. And what's said in, in uh, the text that we're using, the commentary by Gelsip J, page three, is simply saying here, as it is explained in the Precious Garland, this being uh, Nagarjuna's text, Precious Garland, uh, from generosity, from morality, happiness, and so forth. So we did look earlier at some of the results of some of these, but I, I went back to Nagarjuna's Precious Garland, the translation by Jeffrey Hopkins, and here's the verse that uh, is the full verse. From giving there arises wealth, I talked about that earlier. From ethics, happiness, by that they mean the happiness of a good rebirth. From patience, a good appearance. I mentioned that as well, right? That you have a beautiful appearance because of practicing that. From effort and virtue, brilliance. You know, you have this kind of... Uh, brilliant um, energy and ability to get things done. From concentration, peace. 
a peaceful disposition because we've tamed the mind through meditative stabilization. From wisdom, liberation, you know, liberation from uh, all the afflictions and so on by virtue of knowing uh, ultimate truth, knowing emptiness. And then the final line of this verse from Nagarjuna is, from compassion, all aims are achieved. And this is kind of pointing back to what we talked about earlier, that we have that root of great compassion that grows into bodhicitta. And on the, from the root of all of that, all of these practices come forward and all of our aims are achieved together with that compassionate motivation of bodhicitta. Then um, I put in a little passage from uh, the Abbot Dr. Drakpa Gelston's commentary on a precious garland. This is, um, I think this is in your uh, handout. It says, furthermore, when all the infinite trainings of the victor's children are condensed, they are definite in number as the six perfections because when training in the conduct of the victor's children for many eons, the excellent resources that are utilized are accomplished through generosity. The excellent body with which one utilizes those resources is accomplished through ethics. The excellent retinue together with whom one utilizes the resources is accomplished through patience. Fulfillment of whatever aims of action that one initiate is accomplished through joyous effort. Those excellences not becoming the conditions for the afflictions and the non-erroneous engagement in the objects to be adopted and to be discarded is accomplished through concentration and wisdom. So this is essentially everything that was in that first column that I went through that's on the handout that I mentioned. Uh, but it gives kind of, again, the results of all of those, the excellences that we get, the, the energy that we're creating by virtue of practicing those. And then finally, uh, Gelche, or again, uh, Venerable Fedor concludes this by saying the nature, divisions, and so forth of the six perfections should be ascertained more extensively from the small and the great stages of the path. Again, the Lama Rim texts by Lama Tsongkhapa. Uh, there are many other commentaries by other masters, but Lama Tsongkhapa is a renowned being quite complete and extensive, especially the Lama Rim Chanmo, the great treatise. The way of practicing them is explained extensively here in this text, and I already pointed out how that is spelled out in terms of the second through perfections being the fifth through ninth chapters. And then again, in the 10th chapter, we deal with the first perfection of giving. So let me stop it here just to see where people are at or if there are any questions. Again, you have two options if you do have some questions or comments. One is to put them in the chat box, clicking on that button and putting that to, uh, into that screen. Uh, the other one is you can unmute your mic if you'd like and you can ask a question. Uh, keep in mind that again, you will show up on the uh, uh, video if you do that, which is perfectly fine with me, but <laughs> I'm on the video all the time, so. <laughs> If anyone needs or wants to ask a question, uh, you can do so now. Hi, Don. Hi, Lynn. I have hi, Lynn. A, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. I had a, thank you so much for the teaching. Um, You're welcome. Yeah, it's really, really helpful and so clearly laid out. Um, it's easily understandable. I had a question about the transcendental wisdom. Okay. Um, did you say that transcendental wisdom was a combination of both the compassion wing and the method wing? Um, let me go back to that passage again where we had um, that was under the method and wisdom not being trained in separately. Mm -hmm. So again, guess, when we look, go ahead. Just to add to that, like is, is ultimate bodhicitta transcendental wisdom? We could say definitely that ultimate bodhicitta includes that the wisdom realizing emptiness within the mind, the support of bodhicitta. So that verse again was from the purification of Arachana where that term transcendental wisdom was mentioned. It said the transcendental wisdom that knows all, the keeper of the secret, arose from the root of compassion, arose from the cause of bodhicitta, is the culmination of this path that is complete. So we can say that, yes, this transcendental wisdom is sort of the wisdom that is arising within bodhicitta, kind of that being the more compassion side of it. You know, these two, again, when we practice in sutra, they're always kind of one to the other, but they are always supporting and helping each other to develop. But you can have a wisdom 
that realizes emptiness, as I pointed out earlier, without bodhicitta. That would be the wisdom realizing emptiness that is uh, in the mind of a Hinayana practitioner who wants to achieve their own liberation. So I, I don't know, I don't have in front of me any of the Tibetan and I couldn't tell you, even if I had the Tibetan, I'm not sure I'd be able to discern because I don't do much work with Tibetan, what this is a translation of. Uh, when Venerable Fedor translated this as transcendental wisdom, I'm assuming it is meaning the wisdom that is together with that bodhicitta. Certainly that's how it's described, but we will be mm -hmm. talking about ultimate bodhicitta then, which is the mind realizing emptiness supported by bodhicitta. Because you know? I was just thinking of it as it applies to Vajrayana practices, mm -hmm. that that transcendental wisdom um, is um, ultimate bodhicitta as, mm -hmm. and um, the wisdom realizing emptiness. Mm -hmm. And in, in the tantric path, you know, when I was just talking about how in sutra, you sort of go back and forth, you know, you practice your compassion side, your method side, and then you go back and based on being rooted in that, you practice the wisdom side, and then the, you come mm -hmm. out of the wisdom side and you practice the, the method side and you go back and forth. In tantra, you're trying to bring both of those together. That's why we often call it a the union of method and wisdom is that you're using the compassionate wish to benefit others, which is your practices to do deity yoga, to try to want to become a Buddha for the sake of others through practicing all the visualizations and practices. And then you're doing that within the sphere of emptiness. So you're actually trying to create a mind that is having both at the same time rather than going back and forth. So in Tantra, it's taught in that context of it not being something that requires a back and forth, but rather a union of both of those in one moment of mind, which sounds a bit outrageous <laughs> to accomplish. Mm -hmm. but, um, Actually, that's, that's helpful. That clarifies it for yeah. me. Okay, good. Thank good. you. Thank you, Lynn. Anyone else, any other questions or comments? Okay. All right, well then let's go back and do a few more slides because like I said, I was really hoping to you know, get into some verses if, I, if possible, but there is a little more introductory material. And once more, this is in the handout, the set of pages that, uh, again, it was a larger file that uh, went out quite some time ago for most of you. Uh, but if you uh, haven't seen that again, let someone know and they will get that to you. I wanted to go into mindfulness and introspection. Remember that they were on the very beginning slide that we were looking at in terms of going into this chapter that we were looking at this idea of, of you using these two factors. It was, again, the outline for this chapter. It says, uh, explaining the way of training in morality by relating it to introspection and mindfulness, the methods for keeping virtuous dharma pure. You know, whereas we looked at conscientiousness in chapter four, this is an underwriting kind of motivation that is there that keeps us on the straight and narrow. Mindfulness and introspection are what we need in the moment mindfulness especially in as many moments of our lives as we can introspection being a force that we also have to use occasionally to make sure that our mindfulness hasn't diminished so let's look at some some terminology on these because we are going to see these coming up almost from the very beginning of this chapter i kind of did this with conscientiousness to some degree gave you some information on how that mental factor is talked about uh, drenpa is mindfulness um, shejin is uh, introspection mindfulness is described by uh, jeffrey hopkins so he was kind of referring to some of the traditional uh, low rick mind and mental factors texts in his book meditation on emptiness and this is how he described it. He says, mindfulness is non-forgetfulness with respect to a familiar phenomenon. It has the function of causing non-distraction. So mindfulness, you know, it's interesting. We use mindfulness a lot in our culture, right? There's uh, even a big wave around mindfulness in Buddhist circles and, and there's a mindful magazine and everything, all these different things in our culture. And sometimes when mindfulness is talked about, uh, it's described as a sort of unconditional presence with whatever's arising. I mean, that's, you know, a part of what we mean by mindfulness here. But we are talking about always being mindfulness of something else. When Lama Zopa teaches on mindfulness, he says, well, mindfulness, I mean, everyone has mindfulness to some degree. You couldn't drive a car without mindfulness. Rinpoche says it has to be mindfulness of something. Here, it's again of a familiar phenomenon that we're primarily focusing on in terms of this chapter, that familiar phenomenon being our engagement in virtue and our abandoning non-virtue uh, in terms of our ethical behavior. 
And of course, we need mindfulness with regard to everything else that we practice. But here is where it's being emphasized, because if we don't have that mindfulness, we will forget and we will engage in non-virtue and forget our opportunities to practice virtue. So it has the function, as it says here, of causing non-distraction. It keeps you from getting distracted to something else. And it says mindfulness, if it then has three features, it has an objective feature, which is a familiar object. Mindfulness cannot be generated towards an unfamiliar object. You can't maintain mindfulness of something that you're not familiar with. This is why we study the Dharma a lot, is because we want to be familiar with it so that we can bring it to mind and be aware of it, not forget it throughout our day. Secondly, it has a subjective feature, non-forgetfulness within observation of that object. So from the subjective side, the mind, it's not forgetting. It's not allowing the mind to stray from that. So it's the familiar object and the mind that's not forgetting it. Even though one might have become familiar with an object previously, if it does not presently appear as an object of mind, mindfulness cannot occur. So we need that mental side, subjective side, which is remembering that object, not forgetting it, holding it in our awareness. The third is that it did have, as we saw from the definition that Jeffrey Hopp gave, a functional feature. It causes non-distraction. It causes to be going off to our speech and, and physical actions follow that. So it says, since the stability of the mind increases in dependence on mindfulness, non-distraction is specified as the function of mindfulness. You know, we make our mind much more stable. We make our mind much more aware and present of what it's doing and being mindful of what we want to be doing so it won't get distracted to what we don't want to do, what we want to abandon. So mindfulness that possesses these three features is extremely important for putra and tantra practice as all auspicious quality in dependence on mindfulness and introspection, this other mental factor. So we need mindfulness for whatever we're practicing, sutra, tantra, or what have you. If we lose that mindfulness, then we've lost what the object we're meditating on, and the mind's gone elsewhere. The mind's gone to some other object through that forgetfulness. And one more uh, quote here on this. I think this is the final one. In particular, all achievements of meditative stabilization in sutra and tantra are attained through the power of mindfulness. It's a very important factor when it comes to developing concentration, meditative stabilization, you know, it's uh, maintaining our awareness of whatever it is that we're focusing on. Then in terms of introspection, this other mental factor, it's kind of interesting. Introspection, Shijin, is not usually set out as one of the 51 mental factors in Lohrik in that study of uh, Buddhist psychology. But nonetheless, it's said to be, as it says here, kind of have the nature of wisdom, wisdom being one of the uh, mental factors, uh, wisdom being a sort of a discernment of things. Uh, introspection is described often as being like a spy. And the, Jeffrey Hopkins uses the idea of here of a spy in wartime. Just as a spy is not, and this is, yeah, not Jeffrey Hopkins, I'm sorry, we're, we're at Lati Rinpoche and Den Malocha Rinpoche, who did a, a text that I think uh, Jeffrey Hopkins may have translated part of it. But anyway, uh, in that text, they say, just as a spy is not an actual combatant, but is included within the category of combatants, so introspection, which is like a spy in that it analyzes the mind to see whether laxity or excitement has arisen, is included among the antidotes. It's included among kind of the factors that we need to make the mind focused, to make the mind very strong and stable in terms of what we're doing. So they often use this analogy of it being like a spy in the corner of the mind that checks in. You know, often when we give meditation instruction, even I did it tonight, you want to have that vigilance, that introspection that is checking to see the quality of your meditation. And if you're meditating on the breath, for example, and then, you know, after a couple of minutes, maybe you check in through this force of this mental factor of introspection, this spy, and you see that the mind has wandered, then you know that you've lost your mindfulness. The mindfulness of the breath is no longer being maintained. So it's at that time that the, you then correct it. You bring the mind back to the breath. So again, introspection is important, not just on the cushion. It's important during our day because we always want to make sure that we bring our awareness back to what we're intending to do. So I'm just going to do one or two more slides and then we will end for tonight. Um, so then there's a, a little bit of a description on your handout 
about the difference to mindfulness and action uh, from the attention revolution, a book by Ellen Wallace. He says, Buddha Gosa drew this distinction between mindfulness and introspection. Mindfulness has the characteristic of remembering. Its function is not to forget. It is manifested as guarding. Introspection has the characteristic of non-confusion. Its function is to investigate. It is manifested as scrutiny, scrutinizing, trying to discern what's going on, whereas mindfulness is what's holding it there, what's guarding the mind, keeping it in that place. So you have these two factors that work in tandem. Mindfulness being the main thing we were trying to cultivate, introspection being the factor that helps us to discern whether or not we're with that mindfulness. And he goes on to say his contemporary, uh, Buddha Gosa's contemporary Asanga, offers a view that is strikingly similar. Mindfulness and introspection are taught, for the first prevents the attention from straying from the meditative object, it holds the object, doesn't forget it, while the second recognizes, recognizes that the attention is straying when it is doing that. So without the, both of them, you wouldn't be able to maintain a, a complete mindfulness because the mind would stray and you wouldn't recognize it because you've lost your mindfulness and the introspection hasn't seen it, hasn't noticed it, hasn't discerned it. And finally, Shantideva's definition of introspection appears to reflect both these views. In brief, this alone is the definition of introspection, repeated examination of the state of one's body and mind. So introspection is that, that examining mind, that discerning mind, that investigating mind that is checking in to see what the quality is of one's body, one's mind, you know, whatever we're doing physically, verbally, and assuring that we're on track. I'm going to share that the next time. This is uh, where it's taught in terms of the traditional antidotes, why it was said earlier that it is included in the antidotes. Um, I'm not going to go into that today because we just don't have the time for that. I've already gone about a minute over. So. So what we will do in the next class, again next Monday, is that we'll pick that back up and just finish off a brief introduction to mindfulness and introspection and then dive right into the chapter. And the chapter, again, gives us lots of advice. It's a really nice chapter. Um, uh, I think Venerable uh, Pema Chodron has done some audio recordings on it that are really sweet to listen to. Of course, she always takes things, maybe not quite from such a scholastic manner, but really from an experiential manner. And um, I think those are called Don't Bite the Hook, I think are the audio teachings on that. And I'm going to try to listen to some of those as we go through and maybe add a few of her comments here and there. But, um, and her commentary is also a nice one. The book that she wrote, it's called No Time to Lose. It's on your uh, reading list. So let's go ahead and if you um, uh, do have any other questions that come up, can please uh, feel free to pass them along. I think most of you have an email address for me or a way to get something to me. So please do that and I'm happy to address them. Let's go ahead and go back to the prayer sheet. I'll put that on the screen. We've got to go down a few pages to where the dedication prayers are. So again, let's recite this first verse, which is dedicating all the positive potential we've created through doing this tonight for our own enlightenment and the enlightenment of being. Due to the merit of virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead us without exception into that enlightened state. Then this verse is all about that mind of bodhicitta that is the essence of this text. Recall that in the first course, we looked at how the first three chapters are about this first part, uh, that which hasn't arisen, get it to arise, to grow in our minds. Um, uh, and then that which has not has arisen for it not to diminish. That's actually chapters four, five, and six, to guard the mind, to protect the mind so that we don't diminish in any way the strength of that bodhicitta. And then how we increase it more and more is through the remaining chapters, through generating great enthusiasm and uh, allowing the mind to uh, rest single-pointedly and to generate great wisdom. So let's recite this verse and with that understanding, but also with this strong intention that bodhicitta develop within the hearts of all beings, especially those who are manifesting in, you know, very difficult ways in this world right now, you know, may they have this mind that will be the salvation for both themselves and others. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Then we finally just do a few uh, long life prayers, uh, these briefer prayers for His Holiness, as well as for Rinpoche, Lama Zopa. As we recite each of these, we can think about all of our other spiritual guides and dedicate for their good health and long lives as well. 
the wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world. To the incomparably kind Tenzin Gyatso, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjunas' victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers, honoring the three jewels, savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. Then finally, we can dedicate for those that we're holding in our hearts right now, certainly with everything that's going on in this world, we can extend our hearts greatly to all those beings who are affected by coronavirus, uh, and the fear, the anxiety, as well as those experiencing uh, an impairment to their health, as well as the loss of life. All of that moves us greatly, I'm sure. So we can dedicate in that way, in a very general way for all of those beings but also hold in your heart all those other beings that uh, are in your life, who you know about, who are experiencing obstacles, who may be dealing with other forms of illness, who might have died recently or may even be dying at this time. You know, dedicate for those beings especially because you have a connection with them, because they're uh, in your life for a reason to help you to generate this even deeper compassion and concern. We think that by dedicating for them, it becomes the cause to relieve all their suffering and to bring them to the causes of perfect happiness. And may all beings attain true happiness through what we've done here tonight. Okay, thank you all so much. It was very wonderful to be with you again tonight. And I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Stay safe and healthy, everyone, please. Thank you.